I was browsing through the packed library at a friend's house recently when Henry, his roommate, noticed my picking up and looking through Paul Brunton's 1935 tome on inner peace called The Secret Path. Perceiving a kindred curiosity, Henry was quick to begin sharing his notions of mind and thought as they combined to create and influence all phenomena, incorporating his strongly held views of the pineal gland being the spiritual seat of all perception and human undertakings. This from the New World Encyclopedia. The pineal gland is a small pine cone shaped endocrine organ found in the skull of vertebrates. Pea sized, it produces and secretes melatonin in a circadian rhythm with higher levels in the dark phase and lower levels in the light phase. It appears to be sensitive to small amounts of light that penetrate the skin and skull in some vertebrates or via the retina in mammals. It seems to play a role with respect to circadian rhythms and in some aspects of regulating sexual development. However, the importance and role of the pineal gland is not clearly understood and this mystery has historically led to various metaphysical theories. Our conversation continued into the living room and when I didn't enthusiastically concur with his viewpoints, after suggesting that I might not want to hear this, he informed me that I am, regretfully, a very narrow-minded person, obviously and stubbornly lacking any real imagination. Having reached a point in our talk beyond which harmony might be difficult, I internally laughed it off agreeing that he might be correct while subtly moving our talk into one less theoretical and perhaps more practical. Our topic became mind's relationship with cause and effect. The discussion was good. Henry is a passionately thoughtful man. The rest of our visit was pleasant and at its end, we parted as friends. On the drive home and in the days since, that word, imagination, has been twining around my mind. Most notably, what roles does imagination play in Mahayana Buddhist practice? And what is the Dharma path's impact upon the empowering of imagination? So, what is imagination? According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, imagination is one, the ability to imagine things that are not real. Two, the ability to form a picture in the mind of something that has not been seen or experienced. And three, the ability to think of new or familiar things in new ways. Here's a nuts and bolts discussion regarding the relationship between imagination and Tibetan Buddhist visualization practices from Dr. Alexander Berzin, a scholar, translator, and teacher of Buddhism. Quote, one of the things that characterizes the Tibetan form of Buddhism is its extensive use of visualization, much more than in any other form of Buddhism. In order to understand the various levels and usages of visualization, first we need to throw the word visualization out the window it is the wrong word, because the word visualization implies something visual. In other words, it implies working with visual images, and it also implies working with our eyes. This is incorrect. Instead, we are working with the imagination. When we work with the imagination, we're not only working with imagined sights, but also with imagined sounds, smells, physical sensations, feelings, emotional feelings, and so on. Obviously, we do that with our minds, not with our eyes. If we think of the Western psychological division of the brain into a right side and a left side, Tibetan Buddhism develops both sides, both the intellectual, rational side and the side of creative imagination. Therefore, when we speak of visualization in Buddhism, we're not talking about some magical process. We're talking about something quite practical 
in terms of how to develop and use all our potentials because we have the potentials on both the right and left sides of the brain. When we work with the imagination, we're dealing with creativity, artistic aspects, and so on." Unquote. Additionally, consider the previously shared Merriam-Webster definition of imagination as being the ability to think of new things regarding the following short list of fundamental Buddhist perspectives. We use imagination to help us overcome the causes of our own sufferings. We use imagination to consider, understand, and accept the Indra's net quality of the infinite interdependence of all phenomena. We use imagination to initially consider, investigate, and ultimately accept the Buddha's teachings on Tathagata Garbha, that is the perfect Buddha nature that exists at the core of all sentient minds. We use imagination to comprehend and realize the arising and abiding of pure well-being and mental health that the path of Dharma studies, practices, and meditations can lead us to, and the resulting beneficial effects we can then share with others. We use imagination to render and work with a Buddha or specific iconic deity in our meditations as an object of focus to help us gain perfect concentration. We use imagination to begin to sense the presence of what Aldous Huxley called mind at large, that omniscient aspect of our mind that sits behind the limiting factors of narrow self-perspectives and the control of our filtering ego. We use imagination to work towards the knowing through experience surety that selfless generosity really does produce deep abiding happiness. And we use imagination to understand both intellectually and experientially the absence of any intrinsic independent essence that is the emptiness in ourselves as well as all other phenomena. In retrospect, as so often occurs, the door to an entire line of thinking and insight was unexpectedly kicked open, and I thank Henry for provoking my imagination. As a result of his comment, I've given much effort to sustaining this fertile energy of mind, striving to keep it in the forefront of all I do, calling for it whenever I feel myself falling into narrow, habitually reactive Shen Pa moments of mind. So once again, it's the oft-spoken truth. We encounter our teachers when we least expect them, and their messages often appear at first to be unpleasant, difficult to embrace, or unwelcome. But if we're fortunate, bountiful imagination, the ability to think in new ways arises, and then off we go. And so, in conclusion, perhaps for just a few moments, you can let your imagination go as you reflect on these words from the Dhammapada, evoking some of the Buddha's qualities. He is calm like the earth that endures. He is steady like a column that is firm. He is pure like a lake that is clear. He is free from samsara, the endless round of suffering. In the light of his vision, he has found true freedom. His thoughts are peace, his words are peace, and his work is peace. And I would like to add, the Buddha is you. This recording, titled On Imagination, was written by Mark Winwood. Mark, that's me is the founder of the Chenrezig Project, a Colorado-based Tibetan Buddhist study and practice group with an increasingly international online presence. You can learn more about the Chenrezig Project at our website, www.chenrezigproject.org. That's C-H-E-N-R-E-Z-I-G project.org. Or by sending an email to me, at info at 
Our accompanying music, titled Helicopters and Small Planes, was composed by our collaborator, the San Francisco Bay Area musician Bobby Vega, and appears on his 1997 album, Down the Road. Bobby's musical feel is legendary, and with the songs on this album, he shares how transitions and melody can beautifully and subtly express a range of feelings. You can learn more about Bobby and his music at his website, www.bobbyvega.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y-V-E-G-A.com. Or, as he's very findable online, you can simply Google his name or look for his numerous videos on YouTube. As always, we remain grateful to Bobby for his friendship, his talents, and his generosity in sharing his music with us in these broadcasts. Please feel free to share the link to this with those you feel it might resonate. And thank you for listening.